Jack here, JBF Music and Guitar Lessons, back with some more signature guitar lick goodness for you. Quickly, before we get into it, the tabs are up on my patreon.com forward slash JBF music if you want them. If you enjoy this content I'm putting out, then please let me know with a like, a comment. Both really help out the channel as well as the visibility of this video. And if you haven't already, feel free to give subscribe a click to the whole notification thing to see more of this kind of content. So here we've got a player who mixed together blues driven rock, 80s hair metal, neoclassical ideas, borderline psychedelia and even Beatles-esque soft rock ballads, leaving a bigger, more widespread musical legacy in just 25 years, if you can believe that, than most of us could ever dream of. The late, great Randy Rhodes. There are way more cool tricks to his playing than I can get through here, so if you want more Randy, I don't think there's a way to phrase that where it doesn't sound bad, but if you want to see more stuff based on him, then let me know in the comments. Alright, so we've got four licks and ascending difficulty, from a live version of I Don't Know, Mr Crowley, you looking at me looking at you, and that final epic run from Crazy Train. I've done these all by ear with no access to the masters of the stems, any corrections or suggestions as always more than welcome, but let's just get on with it eh? Okay, full tone bend, pretty standard rock idea with these two notes. We then have a partial harmonic on the 6th fret, I'm kind of aiming for around here, so kind of at the back end of my neck pickup, followed by some legato, so pull off, hammer on, pull off. Us using this note here, this 4th fret, with a blues scale is Randy all over. Listen out for it, it pops up loads in his playing. We've got a bluesy bend on the bluesy note, maybe just a quarter tone at most, back to the B string. Another one is these partial pinches, again aiming in the same area, and a pull off. Same kind of pull off idea using the 5th fret with no harmonic this time. And these two notes to wrap it up. So for some music theory analysis we're in G minor here. We're combining Aeolian, arguably Phrygian, like in my Phrygian blues scale tutorial, I'll eye up there for more on that. But Aeolian is more typical of Randy Rhodes. It's a pretty blues rock line to begin with. But with the harmonics, and this flat 6 interval, that aforementioned 4th fret, gives it that 80s edge. The quarter tone bend on the flat 5 is a bit unusual as well, but it just sounds really great. Resolving the lick eventually to the flat 3rd. The main takeaways here are using kind of blues, rock licks, hybrid scale, using the, specifically the Aeolian blues, partial pinch harmonics, microtonal bends on the blues note, and legato and finishing on the flat 3rd. Thank you. 
one of those neoclassic hard rock licks that seems simple and to a certain extent is, but the real challenge comes from keeping it crisp and clean. For some tricks on consistent legato, check out the six tips with the eye up there. We basically have one shape per bar, hitting the E string, pulling off, then playing a single note on the B string. This pattern is just repeated. So first up this guy, that's 17, 13 down to 15. Pretty similar, but we're just moving the little finger up a semitone here. So 18, 13 down to 15. Then we've got this one down here, where we're moving to the 15 to the 12 on the E, down to the 13 on the B. And then the last one we have is 17 to 13 on the E, playing the 13 again on the B. So you probably just want to bar your first finger across the A and the B strings, or just kind of roll it slightly between the two strings here. As a side note, I think Randy goes up to the 18th fret here on the fourth repeat, but I could just be mistaken over here and things, so just go with whatever sounds right to you. As I mentioned, keeping this crisp is a bit of a trick here, so if you keep this finger held down, for example, the notes are going to bleed into each other, which is alright, it's a certain aesthetic, but if you want to keep it more clean, what you want to do is lift this finger up just a tiny bit off the string, and that will mute it. Also, when you bring this finger down, you can kind of use the edge of your finger almost to mute the E string as well. And again, when I'm going up to this note here on the E, I'm just lifting this finger up. It might not look like it because I'm trying to keep it as close to the string as possible to, you know, economy of motion to keep things as smooth and speedy as we can get them. But if you just lift your fingers up a tiny bit, it keeps it way cleaner than if you hold everything down. The real meat of this lick, however, I think is in the music theory. You'll notice I've popped little card names up there, and that's because that's what we're playing over, and he's being pretty strict with it. This sort of thing can make a lick sound really epic or just totally misplaced. So over the D minor, we've got an A, an F, and a D. A D minor chord consists of a D, an F, and an A. So what we're just doing here is going 5th, flat 3rd root. Over the G minor, we're sort of implying a G minor 7, which is G, B flat, D, and F. The notes we're playing are a B flat, F, and D. Now, the music theorists among us will have noticed that this is in fact just a B major triad, but because we're playing over a G5 chord, if you stick these notes on top of the G, you'd get a G, B flat, D, F, which is the aforementioned G minor 7. It's a bit more simple now, we're playing over a C using its 5th, 3rd and root, so a G, an E and a C. You can, if you think of this sweep, we're just really using this top little bit up here. If you don't know those uh, common arpeggios, feel free to check out the little eye up there for the most useful sweep shapes you'll come across. Finally, over the F major, we're playing its 3rd, root and 5th, we have an A, an F and a C. This 18th fret, is the 4th, so it's maybe hinting at an F sus4, but very much in passing. The main takeaways here are arpeggios, legato, using a repeating pattern to follow chord progression, and indeed using the same picking pattern to that end, making good use of inversions to keep in one area of the neck.
again, this is a bit of a legato workout to say the least. It's much more of a hammer on pull off kind of guy than a strict picker, but this technique is crucial to Randy's sound. The other tricky thing here is the muting. If you've ever wondered why he does that kind of cool looking thing holding his hand over the strings a bit like that. It wasn't to look flashy, it's probably to mute the strings. I don't find that thing he does too comfortable, I tend to use more of the kind of my palm, maybe this bit of it here, resting against the strings there, but with a little bit more pressure. So to not derail this video too much, you can check out my top 10 muting tips with the video and I up there. As a side note of sorts, I believe Randy used a Marshall Super Lead. To me it's maybe a sound between an older Plexi and a more modern JCM. Quite bright, quite harsh, but really gives that air pushing sound and weight, there's a lot of body to the sound. I guess he had them pretty cranked because if you play this type of lick on that type of amp and you don't have your muting down, especially if you're the only guitarist in the band, it's going to get pretty messy pretty quickly. So I would suspect that's where this technique has come from. Nowadays we can just plop a noise gate in a digital chain to tame things a little bit and maybe stick a compressor in to level it out. From what I can tell, Randy has a more kind of bare bones rock and roll approach. If you know any better about his gear or his rig, then do correct me in the comments. So I think this first pattern is struck once, just going... Picking the note once is what I mean to say there, and then just successive pull-offs and hammers. You're kind of hitting it, pull-off, and then hammering on from nowhere, really. There is something interesting going on with the timing here, but I think he's just rushing things slightly ahead of the beat more than anything else. The next bar, there is also kind of a grace note as well. It kind of slides down to here if you want to keep it authentic here. You kind of hear that 11th fret before we begin the second bar. It's the same idea. You're picking the note, pulling off, hammering on from nowhere, and doing that. Although I think in this one he hits it again, so I think he does, what that be, four, one, two, three, four, and then the fifth one hits it again to do another four. But do this at your own discretion. You'll also want to experiment with whether you have your first finger anchored or let it lift up. I, I can't really make up my mind over which I feel is better, which is the most consistent result, so let me know how you guys get on with it. And in the next bar here we're moving the same shape across the E and the B strings, this one. The last three notes is a pretty cool trick as well, he's playing the open string, which gives us a bit more time to shift position for this next bar. Had I not listened closely to the solo, I'd have totally missed this out and just assumed he was still going. Now it's just a minuscule difference, but it's really interesting when you listen closely to these sorts of solos, there's all these kinds of little tricks that they throw in just to get from A to B a bit more easily. The final bar switches things up, we're pulling off from the open string from the 12th. Same idea with the 9th. A little trill, and then to wrap it up, some pedal point. For more on that particular technique and some licks to impress, check out the little eye up there. Alrighty, so music theory time. We're playing over an E major, and here we're using G sharp, an F sharp, and an E. So we've got the third, the second of the root. The next bar we're playing over a B. What we've got are its fifth, fourth, and third. B major being a B, a D sharp, and an F. In the next bar, the progression goes out of key, playing a D major. Very typical classical type progression. So it goes E to B to D. So for D, we're playing the third, the second, and the root, and the E string, the major seventh, the sixth, and the fifth, and the B string. So you're basically going down to the chord tones of being a root and a fifth. Over the C-sharp minor, we've got E's on the 12th fret and it open, C-sharp minor is flat 3rd, this 9th fret is a C-sharp, so the root, and the 11th fret gives us the 2nd or, or the 9th for a bit of variety. Main takeaways here, you've got legato, the muting, the neoclassical ideas, playing in one position, which I think we had in the previous lick, using inversions and also chord progressions which modulate or change key.
Okay, and what is probably the star of the show? This is one of those licks I've never heard done quite right. Certainly when I've learned it in the past, I've never taken the time to really check all the notes. It always sounded a bit off. If you check the isolated track and listen out for the left speaker specifically, it's a little bit easier to make out. So if you put your headphones on, take off the right one and just listen to the left, you can probably hear it a bit more clearly. Anyway, we're alternate picking the first four notes with a little bit of light palm muting and possibly a lighter palm muting throughout the look as well. Then it's lots of legato using three note groupings. It's worth using alternate picking here for each note. So we're going to start on the slip and fret on the A, onto the D string, up to here, onto the G. This last bit could be pretty tricky, but if you've been alternate picking the legato, so after this bit, then up, down, up, if you've gone down, up, down, up, you'll hit this 14th fret with a down. What I think Randy did, and indeed what I would do during this next hammer, is hop over to the E string and get ready for a mini upward sweep. So I'm tilting my pick like this, exaggerating it because you can't really see it behind my hand. What you might think of as upward pick slanting or downward escape strokes across the B and the E strings. So up on that 14th fret, on the E, and this 17th fret we hit on the B is really more of a grace note, so you slide very quickly up to the 19th fret. We have the 17 here, final hammer to the 19. I'd probably rotate my picking angle and hit it with a down, but just pick it in the way that gives you the most consistent results. We have a tone bend after that, hit it again while still bent, return to pitch and then add in some nice vibrato. Slide down and out, this 12th fret is somewhat arbitrary, you can just play anywhere and you get a kind of that rock sound. Cool, so the final thing to watch out for this lick is the shift in timing. The first four notes are 16th notes, so if we're playing 1, 2, 3, 4, that speed. And the notes after this where you use legato switching to triplets so they go quicker. So you have but just make sure you get that kind of gear shift when the legato comes in and I'm sure it'll all fall into place. Okay, Randy is playing over a B5, A5, a G sharp, which I think is just a single note, and then an E or an E5. So we're not really following the chords because it changes a bit too fast, I think. It's more of a riff, really. The main interesting thing is that we're playing an F-sharp Dorian lick. So some nice modal interchange, the intro being a really great example. <laughs> what Aeolian sounds like. If it was Dorian, we'd have... It's just not as cool, is it? <laughs> so if you know your three note per string shapes, you'll just see this as a D-sharp Locrian. Then what we do here is wrap up with some pentatonic goodness. The double tracking of the solo that is recording the same guitar part twice gives the part more audio depth, but also blurs the notes definition a little, which is why unless you listen to just one side at a time, either the left or the right, headphones are great here like I mentioned before, it can be pretty hard to decipher. Having said that, this sort of line sounds improvised, it has that spontaneity, but it's played the same way in both takes, so clearly it was written out. So a planned but improvised sounding solo which is played twice, not an easy feat to accomplish. Main takeaways here, we've got the light pan muting, legato, using the three note per string scale shapes, modal interchange, double tracking, planned but not clinical sounding licks, using more melodic pentatonic phrases to wrap things up. If you're looking for some more neoclassical ideas, check out that video. This has been Signature Guitar Licks, that's the playlist there. But yeah, hit subscribe to keep up to date with the channel, leave me a comment, check out the tabs on Patreon and enable all notifications by ringing that little bell on the side if you feel so inclined. Cheers guys.